Thank you for joining us for the uh, fifth webinar on the series Navigating COVID-19 Construction Worksite Protocols for Health and Safety. My name is Kenny Leon with the Canadian Construction Association. Uh, before we begin, uh, just a few webinar adequates. Uh, you are already on mute mode, so I suggest you keep that way. Uh, for questions, please use the uh, questions box uh, uh, on the um, on the on the um, on the pop-up on the screen. Actually, uh, we will answer them at the end of the presentation. But you can keep the questions coming in right throughout the presentation. Thank you. Depending on the province, construction is uh, still active and it has become imperative that employers implement measures to mitigate the new and unique risks facing work sites with the COVID-19 virus. On the webinar today to discuss safety protocols, we are delighted to have as our panelists, Loy Levesque, Advisory Service Manager, Saskatchewan Construction Safety Association, presenting on behalf of the Construction Safety Association and Mark Nowakowski from Flynn Group of Companies. Over to you, Loy and Mark. Okay, good afternoon, everybody. I am Loy Lebeck. I'm with Saskatchewan Construction Safety Association. I'd like to thank the Canadian Construction Association for having us attend this session today. This information is crucial at this time. And joining me today is Mark. Hi everybody. Yeah, I'm Mark Novakoski. I'm the, uh, one of our regional um, HSC managers for the Flynn Group of Companies. We're a North American-wide company in every province in Canada, a large building envelope contractor with over 5,000 employees in the commercial industrial sector. So um, this is affecting us in every jurisdiction across Canada um, in unique ways. And uh, yeah, happy to be a panelist with you folks today. So pass it back to Lloyd. Great, thanks Mark. So the CCA's standardized protocols for Canadian construction sites outline the best practices for construction sites in order to maintain the health and safety of all workers required to perform duties during the COVID-19 crisis. The protocols, which include prevention, detection, response measures, as well as links to jurisdictional agencies will minimize the impact of the crisis and ensure business continuity in the construction industry. Today, we're gonna to go over some methods and, and items to consider to mitigate the risks of exposure on your sites. The Saskatchewan Construction Safety Association is a member of the Canadian Federation of Construction Safety Associations, the CFCSA. The CFCSA works as an umbrella organization for provincial and territorial construction safety associations with a shared interest in promoting awareness of construction health and safety, improving information sharing, and collaboratively producing workplace health and safety training standards and information resources. To this end, the CFCSA will work with member organizations to develop joint strategies to move forward with these initiatives. At this time, you can find many resources to help you navigate the coronavirus pandemic on each of the websites for the Provincial Construction Safety Association. The CCA's standardized protocols for Canadian construction sites addresses the following objectives. Prioritize the health and safety of workers and of their surrounding communities. Apply recommendations and best practices from federal, provincial, and municipal public health authorities to construction site procedures. Establish and maintain a common pandemic response plan across construction sites, foster an open communication amongst stakeholders and ensure a respectful work environment, and maintain a healthy and effective workforce within the construction industry. We'll start by going over the responsibilities on site. Different jurisdictions may have different responsibilities, but at a high level, let's review. 
Prime contractors have specific responsibilities for health and safety and must ensure that the activities of employers, workers, subcontractors, and any other parties at the workplace are coordinated. The prime contractor is also required to do everything that is reasonably practical to establish and maintain a system or process that will ensure compliance with the Occupational Health and Safety Regulations and the Workers' Compensation Act. Employers and subcontractors. Construction employers and subcontractors are responsible for ensuring the health and safety of workers by putting policies and procedures in place to keep workers healthy and safe. They must provide workers with up-to-date instructions, training, and supervision on those policies and procedures. Prime contractors, employers, and subcontractors must have a process in place for workers to raise issues and concerns in general, but also specifically about COVID-19 exposure, so that additional precautions and controls can be put in place where required. Contractors are also required to conduct periodic audits, frequency to be determined based on project scale and scope, to verify that the appropriate measures have been implemented and are maintained. Okay, prevention measures. Outlined in this section of the presentation, we will discuss prevention measures. We'll go over such topics like communication and awareness, general control on site, site scheduling and daily site operations, work site and personal hygiene, personal protective equipment, travel, working remotely, and the service industry. Communication and awareness are crucial in ensuring all workers have the knowledge and training they need to protect themselves and others on site during this pandemic. All employers need to have COVID-19 policies and procedures developed for conducting work both on site and for those working from home. These policies need to include how the site will operate to minimize the risk of exposure as well as clearly define the expectations of all persons entering the site. Policies must have provisions for contractors, cleaners, delivery personnel, inspection services, and anyone else that's entering the worksite. Clear signage should be posted at entry points on the construction site and outline the commitment of the contractor to maintain health and safety measures during the COVID-19 crisis with relevant updates from the public health authorities and self-identification screening tools in the various jurisdictions. All workers need to be trained on the policies and procedures on site. These should be covered at site orientations and reinforced regularly at site toolbox meetings. Information is to be provided to employees working from home on how to prevent injuries from eye strain, improper working posture, as well as psychological well being. General control on site. First and foremost, if workers are feeling ill before work, they must con contact their employer and not come to the job site. All employees, all employers, pardon me, are required to verify the health of the individuals before entering the job site. On arrival, document the date, time, and purpose for anyone entering the job site. At the SCSA, we have created a short health questionnaire that can be used on site. At the end of the presentation, I'll share our website address if you're interested in downloading this document or using it to create your own. At the top of the health questionnaire, we do state health screening is voluntary. However, any person who refuses to answer screening questions will be denied access to our work locations without exception. 
Complying with our safety measures is in the interest of maintaining worker safety and those choosing not to comply will not be permitted to work. So the document we created is broken down into three sections. The first section is the general guidelines. Um, it just explains setting up the screening station. Second section is the screening process questions. These are all based on the provincial COVID-19 self-assessment tool. And then lastly is the form containing the screening questions, uh, which include the date, the employer name, worker name, contact phone number for the worker, and it's comprised of five yes or no questions, which are, are you experiencing any of the following symptoms? And there's a list there. Have you traveled outside Canada, including the United States, within the last 14 days? Did you provide care or have close contact with a person with COVID-19, probable or confirmed, while they were ill within the last 14 days? Did you have close contact with a person who traveled outside of Canada in the last 14, 14 days who has become ill? And have you or anybody in your home had contact with someone who is being tested for COVID-19 or who has been diagnosed with COVID-19? If anyone answers yes to any of these questions, they are denied entry to site and sent home to contact the local health authority for further instructions. If an employee starts to experience symptoms while on site, they are to report to their supervisor immediately and will be sent home. The employee will be advised to complete the self-assessment for their local health authority. Information on, on the numbers to call in your specific area will be covered later in the presentation. Detailed tracking of a worker's status must be kept at all times. So for example, where they fit for work, were they sick, were they off work to care for family, etc. This is important information that your local health authority may request if contact tracking is required. Employees who have been ill will not be permitted back on site until advised it is safe to do so by the local health authority. They are the leading authority for all issues related to COVID-19 and only they can provide detailed instructions to employees and employers on when it's safe for them to re return to work. And lastly, all non-essential individuals and visitors are not permitted access to the site. Site scheduling and daily site operations. In order to keep construction sites operating in a safe manner, production schedules will need to be adjusted. Extra time will be required to implement enhanced cleaning protocols, to maintain physical distancing, and to allow for reduction of staff due to illness or the need to care for family members during this time. Owners and trades will need to collaborate to ensure there is clear understanding of how production will be adjusted and what the new site schedule will be. Employers should consider staggering start times, breaks and lunches, segregating sites into zones or areas to keep different crews or trades physically separated at all times, limiting the total number of people on site or in the zone they are assigned to work in, limiting the number of people allowed in facilities like washrooms, trailers, and eating areas at one time to allow for the recommended min minimum physical distancing. Enclosed lunchroom facilities are only made available during inclement weather. All workers are encouraged to eat outside or in their personal vehicle if it's available. Minimize the number of in-person meetings. When required, meetings are to be held outdoors while maintaining physical distancing. Where this is not possible, conduct meetings through teleconferencing or video conferencing. Design the worksite to reduce high traffic areas to provide that minimum physical distancing. 
One-way staircases are established wherever practical to minimize worker uh, contact. Freight elevators are operated and occupied by only one individual at a time or where feasible by respecting the minimum physical distancing guidelines. There are certain tasks where a worker will need to be in close proximity with another worker. Those tasks are going to require extra time to allow for increased sanitation, minimization of contact, and the application of personal protective equipment. Every effort must be made to limit the duration those tasks uh, take place. Work schedules are adjusted to provide time for proper cleaning and disinfecting as required. Okay, worksite hygiene. Additional sanitary measures need to be implemented on site. Hand washing stations should be set up with signage on proper hand washing protocol hand sanitizer stations, and the provision of disinfectant wiping products. All these types of facilities are made available at site entrances, exits, washroom areas, eating areas, offices, and any other areas that have commonly touched surfaces. Hand sanitization is mandatory before entering the site. Commonly touched surfaces on vehicles and equipment are thoroughly cleaned and disinfected at the end of shifts and in between users. Limit access and use of shared devices like coffee machines, water fountains, microwave ovens, etc. And there has to be a means to clean and disinfect those devices between uses. Discontinue the use of common pens for sign-in sheets and site documentation. Consider an electronic means of sign-in, a designated person to record the information, or all employees have their own pen to sign. But really try to discontinue that practice as much as possible. Washroom facilities, wherever possible, Limit the number of users that can be in there at one time to ensure the physical distancing is maintained. Where touch points like door handles and water coolers remain, paper towels should be provided so workers can avoid skin contact. All offices and job sites need to implement additional cleaning measures of common areas. All door handles, railings, ladders, switches, controls, eating surfaces, shared tools and equipment, taps, toilets, personal workstation areas are all wiped down at least twice a day with a disinfectant. Individuals are responsible for cleaning and disinfecting their own workstations, their personal tools, and their personal protective equipment. So this is another form that we have available on the SCSA website, uh, just a, a checklist for contact surface sanitization. This document should be used to ensure a thorough clean is being done on all locations and facilities. However, don't limit yourself to only the items on this list. You must ensure that the list you use directly relates to your facility or job site. This document records whether or not the surface sanitization is pre-shift, hourly, or end of day. Also records the location, employee in charge, the immediate supervisor, date and time, subcontractors, operations, size of crew, and who did the sanitizing. So as you can see on the document, we've broken it down into three columns. So exterior surfaces like door handles, gate latches, handrails, general worksite surfaces like pens for public use, tap handles, filing cabinet doors, and lastly, personal workspace surfaces like tape dispensers, phone buttons and headsets, and staplers. At the end of the document, there's a section for review as well as comments. 
like I mentioned, make sure you add to this document if you're going to use this one or revise it as it, to make sure it covers all necessary areas you need in your workplace. Deliveries and products arriving on site. Delivery zones are clearly identified and limited to receivers and deliverers only. When possible, nothing is passed between the deliverer and the receiver. For example, shipping documents or pens for signatures. Deliveries are unloaded solely by receivers using proper personal protective equipment while the deliverers remain in their vehicles. Where this is not possible, say for delivery of immediate use items such as ready mixed concrete or perhaps a piece of equipment delivered to site, instruct the delivery personnel on the site hygiene requirements and their responsibilities under your policy prior to them coming to site. Define an area for laydown of deliveries. Small items should be disinfected before use if possible, and larger items allow them to sit if you can for the time recommended by health agencies for the virus to expire. Personal hygiene. All workers must exercise the following recommended practices for reducing the risk of transmission as identified by the Public Health Agency of Canada, Health Canada, and the Center for Disease Control. Avoid touching eyes, nose, mouth, or face. If a worker must cough or sneeze, they should remove themselves from the area they're in if they're around other workers, if possible. Cough or sneeze into a tissue or the bend of your arm, not into your hand. Dispose of any tissues you've used as soon as possible in a lined wastebasket and wash your hands thoroughly afterwards. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects and surfaces, including all reusable personal protective equipment. Do not share personal items or supplies such as phones, pens, notebooks, PPE, etc. This would also include tools. If, if you can limit the sharing of tools, that is best practice. Avoid common physical greetings such as handshakes. Maintain that minimum physical distance of two meters from others. Wash hands often with soap and water for at least 20 seconds before and after using the washroom when preparing food, after blowing your nose, coughing or sneezing, or if you're going for a cigarette, make sure you wash your hands before doing that as well. If your hands are not visibly soiled and soap and water are not available, alcohol-based hand sanitizer can be used. And when you return home, remove your footwear at the door, wash your clothes and shower as soon as possible. So now we're going to talk about personal protective equipment. With world shortages and other essential frontline services having mandatory requirements for PPE, a combination of good personal hygiene and site hygiene can reduce the need for pandemic specific PPE. Refer to up to date information from federal and provincial health authorities on what is required. Continue to wear non-pandemic basic and specialized PPE as required by the occupational health and safety regulations for your region. If a task requires PPE for protection against COVID-19 infection, select approved items where possible. When the task is complete, have workers remove the PPE properly and sanitize it if it's reusable. If it isn't, provide lined waste receptacles to dispose of the items. Wear latex or non-latex gloves only for specific tasks. Wearing gloves can lead to unintentional spread, so use sparingly, only for a specific task and then remove them properly and wash your hands. If approved N95 masks are not available, 
face coverings such as a homemade cloth mask should be worn as a potential mitigant to catching and transmitting the virus. It is important to note that these face coverings are not to be treated as substitutes for proper hand washing, physical distancing, and other protective measures. Personal protective equipment always has been, and definitely is in this situation, your last line of defense. Business-related travel. All non-essential business travel is not authorized. Business travel is limited and on an exceptional basis only. All individuals returning from out of country must undergo a 14-day self-isolation period as mandated by the federal government and outlined on Canada.ca. In the event some provincial governments impose similar restrictions for interprovincial travel, any such requirements for self-isolation must be obeyed as applicable. Workers are not to share accommodations such as motel or hotel rooms. Workers should travel to site using individual modes of transportation, their own vehicle, bicycle perhaps. Where this is not possible, every effort to maintain physical distancing must be made, such as limiting ride sharing to two employees with one in the front and one in the back seat. Keep windows cracked to allow fresh air to circulate. So we'll talk a little bit more on safe vehicle sharing. So based on available information, it's estimated that COVID-19 can survive on hard surfaces from 24 hours to several days. It can be spread by touching a contaminated area, then touching your mouth, nose, or eyes before washing your hands. Hand washing and respiratory hygiene are important ways of interrupting this transmission. Social distancing is the best method to pre prevent the spread of COVID-19. But when that is not possible, Employers should include vehicle cabs in their hazard prevention program. So if a barrier such as a plexiglass shield is not possible, personal protective equipment like a face covering or mask should be worn. Maintain good ventilation inside the cab of the vehicle. Have the windows cracked open. Refrain from using the recirculate air option. Have the driver open and close the doors for each passenger he picks up. Provide seat covers that are easy to clean. For example, cover cloth seats with a wipeable uh, seat cover. Avoid having more than two people in the front and two people in the back at a maximum. Ideally, if you have to share a vehicle, try to only have the driver in the front and one person in the back on the passenger side. Make sure no one touches their face, eyes, nose, or mouth. Um, same as with personal hygiene, cover your mouth and nose with the crease of your elbow or tissue when you cough or sneeze. Don't sneeze into your hands, dispose of tissues, and wash or sanitize hands as soon as possible. Hand sanitizer should be available inside the vehicle for the occupants to use. Uh, nobody should eat or drink during the commute. Minimize the number of vehicles shared by employees to limit the spread of the virus between different users. So always have the same employees carpool together if that is required. Ensure that drivers have access to appropriate disinfectants, hand sanitizer, uh, PPE such as gloves, and any other materials needed to clean high touch surfaces in their trucks and implement recommendations. Clean and disinfect frequently touched surfaces inside and outside after each trip. So again, we do have a vehicle cleaning checklist on our website. Um, so for personal protective equipment, use disposable waterproof gloves, avoid contact with contaminated areas, 
and hand contact with the face, especially nose and eyes. Make sure vehicle interiors are clean and hygienic by wiping surfaces with disinfectant. The following equipment should be made available for cleaning, disposable cloths, paper towels, disposable waste bags, labels and tape, cleaning agents and disinfectants. Some of the items on the checklist are keys, key fobs, uh, shift lever on the console, radio and climate control buttons, uh, seat adjusters, seat belt and seat belt release button, and any other areas that are commonly touched in a vehicle. Dispose of cleaning cloths, disinfectant cloths, disposable gloves, and any other items used in the cleaning process in a disposable waste bag, and then wash your hands thoroughly when finished using proper hand washing techniques. And just as a reminder, refer to your safety data sheets, your SDSs, for more information on the safe use, care, and handling of chemicals used in the cleaning process. So example, disinfection agents may cause airway and dermal irritations, have strong order, odors, and present inhalation hazards while being sprayed. Okay, working remotely. Where possible, all office employees should work remotely. Meetings are to be held through teleconferencing or video conferencing. Workers must be aware of the effects of eye strain and improper working positions. Workers must be monitored for signs of stress and mental fatigue. Workers should have access to mental health resources. We'll cover a little bit more on mental health in the coming slides. And the service industry. Many construction-based companies are required to perform service work at public buildings and at private residences. In these situations, the employer cannot ensure that proper sanitization has taken place. Therefore, they must take extra steps to ensure the health and safety of themselves or their workers. Conduct a hazard assessment on the location where the work will be conducted. Extra time will be required to sanitize the work area. Pandemic specific PPE may be required such as disposable gloves and face masks. Personal sanitation is required before entering and after exiting the work area. Instructions are given to persons in that space to maintain physical distancing while you're there. Try to schedule work for certain times to limit exposure of workers to others in the building, such as after the business closes or during the day when a homeowner isn't in the house. If the work is taking place in a home or occupied space, complete a pre-screening questionnaire with the owners or workers before entering the area. And this is a form that you can use. This is again on our website um, and I'll share how to find that at the end. But this is very similar to the health questionnaire that you went through with the workers arriving on site. This one is just having the homeowner um, clarify that they haven't been in contact with anyone. On the questionnaire, or the questionnaire also addresses that if the answer is yes to any of those questions, that the employee conducting the service call should stop work immediately and report to a supervisor. Having response measures in place ensures you are taking a proactive approach to battling this pandemic rather than taking reactive measures. In the following slides, we'll discuss what to do for possible cases of COVID-19 and response plans. Individuals who have been potentially exposed to the virus or who are exhibiting flu-like symptoms such as fever, fatigue, coughing, or congestion are instructed to not come to work. Contact their supervisor and or human resources department, stay at home and self-isolate, and contact the local health authorities for further directions. Such individuals are required to follow the recommendations of the local health authority and may not return to work until given approval by them. 
Individuals who begin to display flu-like symptoms while on site are instructed to avoid touching anything, take extra care to contain coughs and sneezes, and return home immediately to undergo a 14-day self-isolation period. All areas on the site that potentially were infected by a confirmed or probable case are barricaded to keep individuals at least two meters away until the area has been properly cleaned and disinfected. Employer may be asked to provide contact tracking information to health authorities. Monitoring the status of workers is crucial during this time and employee, employers should keep detailed tracking of a worker's status on site, uh, fit to work, sick, off duty, family caring duties, etc. A list of all quarantined workers is updated daily with their privacy maintained and ensure records are kept of which individuals work together and when. Response plans. All contractors are to complete an integrated continuity plan to respond to partial or complete shutdown of construction sites or in the case of a severe limitation of site operations. Mental health. Here in this section, we'll touch on some of the resources that the Canadian federal government, provincial governments, CCOHS, and the SCSA have made available. Living through the COVID-19 pandemic can cause anxiety and worry in all of us, whether you're coping with the loneliness of self-isolation, concerned about the health of your loved ones, or worried about what the future may hold there are mental health supports available to help you through this difficult time. This is the health line number for Alberta, BC, New Brunswick, Quebec, Saskatchewan, Yukon, PEI, Newfoundland and Labrador, and Nova Scotia. The easy quick call 811. In Ontario, Manitoba, and Northwest Territories, Nunavut, these are the numbers that you would call. Good idea to have everyone save these in their phones so they have quick access to it if they require. During the COVID-19 pandemic, CCOHS has made their mental health package free to all Canadians. Courses are unique in that they're developed by subject specialists in the field and reviewed by representatives from labor, employers, and government to ensure the content and approach are unbiased and credible. This is the, the following is a list of the free e-courses currently offered. Mental health awareness, mental health communication strategies, mental health, health and wellness strategies, mental health, psychologically safe workplaces, mental health, signs, symptoms, and solutions. You can find these courses on the CCOH website under hazards, psychological, stress, and then e-learning. Uh, we also have toolbox talks on the SCSA website that you can reference as well. On April 15th, the Honorable Patty Haidu, Minister of Health, launched a new portal dedicated to mental wellness on Canada.ca backslash coronavirus. Wellness Together Canada will connect Canadians, connect Canadians to peer support workers social workers, psychologists, and other professionals for confidential chat sessions or phone calls, and will make it easier to find credible information and help to address mental health and substance use issues. The portal is the result of work of a broad consortium of organizations with experience in providing digital mental health and sub substance use support. Led by Stepped Care Solutions, Kids Help Phone, Homewood Health and Green Space Health, Wellness Together Canada is the first and only mental health platform of its kind for people of all ages in every province and territory. Thank you for joining us today. I hope you've learned some valuable tools to help you navigate the coronavirus pandemic safely. We will now open the floor to questions.
Okay, the link to our website is our website is right there, www.scsaonline.ca. It's under the resources tab, COVID-19. And near the bottom is where you'll find the bulk of the resources on that page. I see another question here um, about how long do P100 cartridges last? Uh, that's a tricky question, question to answer, but you know, essentially, it's you need to follow the manufacturer's instructions. They they do vary manufacturer um, to manufacturer, and, and it does vary greatly. Uh, typically, uh, when they're clogged up or become harder to breathe in, or the filter becomes dirty or physically damaged, it's usually uh, when they have to be replaced. So ho hopefully, that answers your question. There's another question here and it says, what is the occupancy expectation for a large concrete tower construction site with hundreds of workers using hoists of five feet by 12 feet with open grating cage side walls open to outdoors fresh air for the duration of approximately a three minute hoist ride. Workers can stand facing away from each other towards the fresh openings. That's another tricky question to answer. Um, it, it, um, appreciate all the detail in the question. Um, the best the best solution to this is to get all affected parties involved and discuss it on site and refer to your to your local and provincial um, health guidelines. There's another question here. It says, if an employee feels ill while on site, um, must send them home to isolate, what are we providing them with accommodations away from home? Are we required to continue to provide accommodations? How can we transport them home if crew is staying at a remote hotel? Do you want to answer that, Mark? Um, go ahead if you have a have something for that one. Okay. Um, yes, if they if they are ill and you've been providing accommodations, you would have to continue to do so um, unless they can they can find their own way home if they have their own vehicle but are they well enough to even travel? That would be the question there. And if they're staying at a remote hotel or motel, if they don't have their own transportation, somebody will need to transport them home. But that's when you're gonna really have to pay attention, wear your personal protective equipment, make sure they're wearing it, and um, make sure the windows in the vehicle are open so you're having fresh air flow in there. This is a, a real tricky situation. So every possible precaution you can take would be needed. Or call the health authority, see if they have any recommendations on that situation as well. Okay, there is another question here. Do you have any resources or checklists for shared accommodations? And the easy answer is no. It's not recommended to have employees sharing accommodations unless they've already been doing so before this started, which in, in that aspect, it's almost like, um, almost like being in your own home. You're allowed to, to be in close proximity with people you live with, 
that would be a, a similar type of situation, but if you're heading out um, to a job site and providing accommodations starting now, highly recommend not sharing accommodations. Yeah, and I'll, uh, and there's another question that kind of follows up on that regarding uh, specific recommendations for remote work locations or construction crew camp facilities. So kind of going along with all other physical distancing recommendations um, across all the provinces, um, those types of facilities, um, they are avoiding um, common uh, workout and, and congregation areas and uh, meal areas as well. Um, you want to maintain physical distancing as much as possible, um, even while you're in camp off work. And to expand on that, sometimes in a camp facility, it's almost a uh, buffet style of meal. Buffets are a terrible idea right at the moment. So transition to packaged meal options instead. Mm -hmm. And there's another question. Uh, hand washing station, do we need hot water in those stations? Short answer is no, although obviously it would be uh, beneficial to have have uh, warm water when, when washing. There's still, still some parts of Canada where it's still a bit chilly out. Um, and hot water, of course, we know does does do a better job, but something is better than nothing. Uh, question seven we have here is, what are the WCB imp implications of a worker illness death due to COVID? Um, that varies um, by each compensation board and, and not only that, but also by each case. Every province, every case um, and every uh, compensation board will treat them separately on an individual basis. There's another question here. If a worker is wearing a face shield, is there a requirement to wear a face mask? Again, that varies a little bit from jurisdiction to jurisdiction and contractor to contractor, but it is best practice to wear both a face shield and a face mask at minimum when uh, within two meters or less um, of another worker. I'll keep going here. Another question, um, other than physical distancing measures, is there a target max or min number of staff on site? Is reference to groups less than five to six on total site applicable? Okay, in, in Saskatchewan anyway, they haven't put a cap on the number of people allowed on site at one time. It is definitive of, of maintaining that physical distancing. Um, that's what's going to limit the number of people you can have on site. That's right. I, and I would just add that it, it does vary greatly based on the workspace. Next question is, is the employer responsible for com completing the health screening twice per day? Um, it, the short answer is no, um, although there is a requirement for the employer to ensure a, um, a safe workplace and, and to uh, uh, work with the employees to make sure that, that both the employees um, and, the, and the site are, are safe. So if the if it, if that means twice per day or that means once per day, it it uh, is very site specific again. Question eleven: If workers are mandated to wear gloves full time while working, is it necessary to sanitize shared tools twice per day? 
Um, I guess an answer to this, uh, at least from, from uh, a contractor perspective, um, it should almost be prior to use um, is when they should be sanitized. If there's tools, first of all, you want to avoid sharing tools as much as possible. And if you have to share tools uh, app before um, every use is, is really the best practice as far as cleaning. So that might mean more than twice per day. I'll do another one here and then uh, let Lloyd take over. Uh, would it be necessary to have your employee fill out the screening questionnaire daily if they are going home at the end of every shift? The answer, again, best practice is yes, it would be. A lot can change in one day. And I'd expand that you don't know everyone is going directly home at the end of every shift. Perhaps they're stopping to get fuel or groceries. So I, it is best practice to check the health, do the screening questionnaire at the beginning of every shift. Okay, so the next question, what is required from the employer regarding payment of wages for those who are required to self-isolate? Mark, do you have an answer for that one? Uh, it, that's, I'm afraid to say that's another, it varies question uh, based on jurisdiction. Um, it also varies whether it's um, um, a union environment or non-union environment as well. Yeah, that's a real individual question. I'm sorry, that's hard for us to answer here. The best way to set up and structure our screening process um, so the health screening coming on site, I assume is what you're referring to. And we do have on our website, it's, it's all laid out how to go about setting up a screening station. Number one, you want to make sure that it is somewhere um, somewhat confidential. You don't want others overhearing what you're speaking about. Um, so if you can have it in a, in a job trailer or um, an area outside away from everyone else that is best. Uh, the person doing the screening should be the only one touching that pen um, and documenting it during the process. Ideally, it shouldn't be the worker's direct supervisor conducting the screening, but refer to that resource on our website, the COVID-19 Health Questionnaire. Okay, another question. What should be the return to work process for workers who have had to self-isolate due to a positive test for COVID-19? And also if they have had symptoms, but either did not test or received a negative test. So the local health authority is, is the best one to provide direction on when it is safe to return to work. Um, I know if it was a positive um, exposure, if they tested positive to COVID-19, they need two consecutive negative tests prior to being deemed safe to return to site. Um, if they didn't get tested and the health uh, self-assessment line didn't tell them they had to be tested, then a period of 48 hours with no symptoms at a minimum is required before they can return to work. I would echo that. Uh, 
Okay, what is the sanitization protocol for porta potties? Um, definitely um, several times throughout the day is ideal. All workers using the porta potties should be instructed to uh, wipe it down with sanitizing wipes before using it and after using it, just to be on the safe side. Make sure they focus on the door handles and the lock latch as well. Um, I know they may not like having to take those extra steps, but it really is for their protection that they do so. Okay, another question here. It says for our first aid attendants okay, that are. Okay, last question for our first aid attendants that are wearing half masks instead of N95. Do we need patients to be concerned about the drips coming from the exhalation valve, uh, such as do patients need to wear masks as well? Mark, can you speak to that one? Uh, I think so here. So uh, just looking at the question here. Nope. Okay. I, I don't, honestly, I'm not sure about the drips coming out of that valve. That's something I'm going to have to look into a little bit. I highly recommend that patients wear masks as well um, in all circumstances. If seeing a first aid attendant, they are going to be within that two meter distance to each other. So wearing a mask would be best practice and i'm sorry on the other part i i don't know that answer offhand right now um in respect of time it's 259 uh we have to cut off that okay what and... if workers must be closer than two meters to complete tasks uh we covered it a little bit in the presentation and um on the scsa website we do have uh, a toolbox talk uh, on this subject um, as well that you can reference. But basically look at the task and really try and minimize the amount of time that the workers are gonna be closer than that two meter distance to each other. Um, have them wear masks and, and perhaps latex or non-latex gloves just for the time that they need to be working together. They need to thoroughly wash their hands prior to the task and then immediately afterwards. <clears throat> but refer to our, our uh, toolbox talk on that. Again, it's on the SCSA website, scsaonline.ca under the resources tab, COVID-19, resources and near the bottom is where you'll find the bulk of the information uh the time is uh, three o'clock uh, sharp on the dot so we just need to in respect of everybody's time we just need to uh close this webinar right now okay. uh thank you loy and mark for your valuable insight the questions kept coming and one last I... question if you're required to wear a hard hat on site how do you wear a face shield at the same time I'm not sure if Lloyd can hear. You have to have a face shield right that now. attaches to your heart. Thanks, hat. everybody, for attending. And that's all the time we have for today. Thanks for joining us. Uh, thank you, Lloyd and Mark, for your valuable insight. Our sixth webinar on the series will be next Thursday, April 30th, uh, 2 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time, on managing insurance coverage and claims for losses resulting from the pandemic. We will send the deck and the recording of this webinar and of course the links uh, that Loy shared, uh, we will send to you shortly. So thank you once again uh, for joining us. Uh, enjoy the rest of your day and stay safe. Thank you.